I want you to remember, you cannot curse the one that God has blessed. So can we be cursed today? What about this concept of legal right? Well, let's take a look at your legal standing according to Scripture. Romans chapter 3, verse 22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. So the righteousness of Christ has been imputed on you because of your faith in him. So what is your legal standing? Legally, you are standing in righteousness. Okay, let's read Romans 4, 3. For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteousness, righteous because of his faith. So Abraham believes, now he's been given righteousness. That, that's the, 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 the gift of righteousness given to us. How do we get that? We believe on Jesus. He says, okay, now your legal standing is righteous. Romans 3.24, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Guys, that's very pointed there. Let me read that again. Yes, God in his grace freely made us right in his sight. In other words, according to God's opinion, your legal standing is righteousness. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Okay, so is the scripture saying that there's no consequence for wrongdoing? By no means. I just went over in my last point how the choices that you make will bear consequences. But instead of calling those consequences curses, just get your life right. Repent. Walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. And if any trials come your way, rejoice in those and say, I'm blessed even in the trial. Like, I'm not cursed in a trial. So, no, I'm not saying that you can go on sinning and that there are no consequences. But the scripture makes it clear that you've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Watch this, Galatians 3.13. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. Guys, it's right here in the Bible. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So what is that curse? What is the curse of the law? Very plainly told to us, in Romans 9.3. Romans 9.3 very plainly tells us what the curse of the law is. Watch this. For my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. So biblically speaking, to be cursed is to be cut off from Christ. That's God's curse. So as a born-again believer... God does not curse you because of the gift of righteousness given to you. Now, this is not to say that you won't experience material and practical consequences for foolish and sinful decisions. Indeed, in this world, you will bear the consequences of the choices that you make. But this does not mean that you're cut off from Christ because that curse was placed on the one who hung on a tree. So, let me ask you this. What curses remain? If some witch doctor should speak a curse over you, well, a curse only has so much power as the one who speaks it. Does that witch doctor have any power over the believer? Some might interject, well, maybe there's a legal right somewhere in their generations. We just saw that's not biblically true. Well, well, maybe if the believer sins, well, if the believer sins, they're going to bear consequence for that sin. And now they're even going to have the mental struggle of believing in the power of that curse because of that sin. Because of course, it's believable that if you sin, they're going to have some power over you. Can that witch, can that warlock speak some curse? Oh, Brother David, I knew a pastor, and the warlocks were cursing, 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 cursing him. And six months later, he committed adultery. The light's going to turn green now. 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 Ah, there it is. I'm going to curse that pastor. I'm going to curse that pastor. I'm going to curse that pastor. Oh, he commits adultery. There's proof of my curse. Guys, correlation is not causation. And in fact, I would say that that was the pastor's decision to fall into adultery, not some witch doctor's decision. So again, you may have these stories, but that's the difference between correlation and causation. Now, if God speaks a curse, who can undo it? So can a witch doctor curse a born-again believer? No. Is there some legal right? No. Why? Because we're standing in the righteousness of Christ. So, so can some demon pronounce a curse? Well, 
if God calls you blessed, how can they curse you? Okay, well, will God speak a curse? Because if God spoke a curse over you, there's no freedom. And by the way, when we talk about those Old Testament generational curses, that's a curse from God. That's not a curse from some demon. That's a curse from God. And who among us is powerful enough to undo that curse? Only Christ Jesus, which is why when we are born again, we are redeemed from the curse of that law. Okay? So additionally, others who curse you don't have the power to undo what God has spoken. Here's, here's an example of a curse. Uh, Galatians 1, 8 through 9. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again what we have said before. If anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. But that's God's curse. What is that curse? To be cut off from Christ for preaching a false gospel. You can't bless who God has cursed. You can't curse who God has blessed. Nobody's words are that powerful. Nobody's words are that powerful. I mean, imagine a witch doctor coming against you, a spirit-filled believer, walking with the Lord, loving Jesus, doing as you should, and God goes, sorry, my hands are tied. Your great, 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 great grandmother was involved in something very wicked, and now I have no power to set you free until you, A, find that discovery in your family lineage, B, enact a bunch of rituals to undo that, and then C, specifically speak out against that particular thing. Guys, this is why we got to get back to Scripture. This is why so many believers are tormented. This is why so many people are not free. Look, any believer I've seen who comes out from that type of thinking walks in freedom. Any believer I've seen who rejects the truth here of what's being said and goes back to that continues to walk in that bondage. So you can't curse who God has blessed. You can't bless who God has cursed. Here's a perfect example of when someone tried to curse God's people without God's backing. Numbers 22, 41. The next morning, Balak took Balaam up to Bamoth Baal. From there, he could see some of the people of Israel spread out below him. Chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Then Balaam, the prophet, said to King Balak, Build me seven altars here and prepare seven young bulls and seven rams for me to sacrifice. Verse 2, Balak followed his instructions and the two of them sacrificed a young bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, stand here by your burnt offerings and I will go to see if the Lord will respond to me. Then I will tell you whatever he reveals to me. So Balaam went alone to the top of a bare hill and God met him there. Balaam said to him, this is the prophet speaking now to the Lord, I have prepared seven altars and have sacrificed a young bull and a ram on each altar. The Lord gave Balaam a message for King Balak, and King Balak is trying to curse God's people. Then he said, go back to Balak and give him my message. So Balaam returned and found the king standing beside his burnt offerings with all the officials of Moab. So he's waiting. Okay, what did God say? Verse 7, this was the message Balaam delivered. Balak summoned me to come from Aram. The king of Moab brought me from the eastern hills. Come, he said, curse Jacob for me. Come and announce Israel's doom. But how can I curse those whom God has not cursed? See, not even a prophet. Guys, our Christian superstitions, our charismatic superstitions. Again, I'm charismatic. I love the prophetic. I love deliverance. I love speaking in tongues. I love all of that. But we have these charismatic superstitions like like this old wives' tale, you know, as a prophet, you got to be very careful what you say because you can do things in the spirit realm. And that's too, true to some degree because prophets have credibility and authority. And again, they can encourage or discourage, speak deception or truth. They can speak something that drives someone closer to God or pulls them away. They can speak something that causes someone to be bold or fearful, right? So we know that that has some power, but this creative power, guys, Balaam couldn't do it. Balaam was a prophet and he couldn't do it. So this is what the Bible says. How can I curse those whom God has not cursed? It's, in other words, it's not in the prophet's power. How can I condemn those whom the Lord has not condemned? I see them from the clifftops. I watch them from the hills. I see a people who live by themselves, set apart from other nations. Who can count Jacob's descendants as numerous as dust? Who can count even a fourth of Israel's people? Let me die like the righteous. Let my life end like theirs. Then King Balak demanded of Balaam, what have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies 
Instead, you have blessed them. But Balaam replied, I will speak only the message that the Lord puts in my mouth. Some of you are afraid of these prophets of God who've manipulated you, who've, who've tried to intimidate you, saying that they're going to speak something over you because they're a prophet and they have it. Listen, if God didn't give them the authority to pronounce that curse, there's no curse that will work against you. I rebuke that in Jesus' mighty name. That is witchcraft. That manipulation, fear, and intimidation trying to get you to believe in their so-called power when they have no power to do it. So this idea that, oh, well, if you're a prophet, you can do it. Guys, Balaam couldn't do it. And that prophet who tried to intimidate you, those prophets who are trying to manipulate you, guys, you don't have to be afraid of that. You don't have to be afraid of that because if God didn't give them that word, then they don't have the power to do it. And so as long as you're walking with the Lord, my goodness, what do you have to fear? So if a prophet couldn't do it, oh, please hear me, saints of God. If a prophet of the Most High God, filled with the Spirit, who had power and authority from heaven, could not by their own will bring a curse on God's people, what on earth makes you think a witch doctor can? Let me say that again. Type amen in the comments if you're receiving this. If a prophet of God who walks with the Lord who's filled with the Holy Spirit, cannot by his or her own will pronounce a curse on God's people, what on earth do you think a witch doctor can do who's operating in a way lower level of power? But, but, but the stories, guys, we already went over it. Consequence versus curse, correlation versus causation, chaos versus curse. Once you learn those, you begin to see it very clearly. No, they have no power. Not over the children of the Most High. Deuteronomy 23, 4, and 5 puts it very plainly. These nations did not welcome you with food and water when you came out of Egypt. Instead, they hired Balaam, son of Beor, from Pethor, to curse you. Verse 5, I love this. But the Lord your God refused to listen to Balaam. He turned the intended curse into a blessing because the Lord your God loves you. In other words... Balaam couldn't do it without God's, not even a prophet can curse you without God's approval. And so this begs the question, well, what if God gives the approval? We just read you redeemed from the curse of the law. Well, what if God gives a legal right because of something your parents did? We just read in scripture, he does not visit the sins of the father on the son. We read it in Ezekiel very clearly. Ezekiel 18, 20, for those of you who want to go back and reference. Remember, a curse is to speak against, to insult, to wish evil upon. When God speaks a curse, it happens. When we speak a curse, the effects can only go so far. And you know, for the most part, the damage I've seen done by people who speak curses, um, that damage comes from the psychological torment that comes upon the individual because they believe in their power. I'm serious. The damage comes because of the psychological torment. They're afraid, oh my goodness, they cursed me, and now they're walking in that fear. Help us win souls and empower Christians around the world. Become a monthly partner with David Diga Hernandez by signing up for our automatic giving plan at davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. You can also give a single gift by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Your support, single or monthly of any amount, will help us continue to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. Get involved as we win this generation to the kingdom of God.